Our final topic on hash tables is the open addressing strategy. The open addressing approach seeks to avoid the extra storage of all the linked lists that we had coming off of the hash table in the chaining approach by putting all the keys in the hash table itself. Of course, it's got to deal with collisions. So if you store some value, value in the um, cells and then somebody else comes along and that's already occupied, you're going to have to put it somewhere else. So we use something called a probe where we say, well, we probe if it's there then we go somewhere else, and then if it's not there, we put it there. Simple strategy is a linear probe, just check the next position. But there's going to be other strategies that take bigger hops. So first, let's look at what we need to do to the hash function to make this work. Well, this first time we went into here, we were at essentially what we'll call probe zero. And when we found a collision, we tried the first probe. And then when there was another collision, we had the second probe. So what we're going to do here is we're going to give the hash function not only the key, but we're going to give it an i that indicates, indicates which probe we're currently on. So formalizing that, we're going to take our hash function, give it the key, but also the probe number, and we're going to count probes from 0 to m minus 1. Uh, the zeroth probe will just be the ordinary hashing, and then the first, second, and third probes, etc., will be modifications to try to find new positions. So we're going to say that the hash function now maps from the universe of keys times 0, 1, m minus 1 to the available positions in the table, also m minus 1. The, we're going to require that the probe sequence, here's a probe sequence, h, k, the first attempt, h, k, the second um, well, the zeroth attempt, the first attempt of the probe, if you want to count that way, uh, up through h of k m minus 1. If this fails, the table is full. Uh, so we want this uh, probe sequence to have some permutation of the values of from the positions from 0 to m minus 1. So another way to state this requirement is that all of the positions are visited. Of course, you want it to check every possible place. So there's three possible outcomes to a probe. Either k is already there. That's a successful search. There is nothing there. Maybe the slot will be marked as containing nil. That's an unsuccessful search. Or some other key is in the slot, which means we need to continue the search probing at a new location. And that's when we will increment uh, this i I will represent which probe that we're in, this I up here. So we can write different hash functions that take different strategies in the subsequent probes. And we'll get back to that later. But first, let's look at some pseudocode for how this works in general. For convenience, I'm just using the um, version from my web notes. So here we have uh, hash insert. This is actually taken from the, the textbook. We give it a table and a key. And it's going to have a hash function right here. So the first time this is called i is 0, so it does the ordinary hashing h of h of k. And then it's going to check the table position j that's the result of the hash. If that's empty, we'll just put it there. We're inserting and return the position. Otherwise, we're going to increment i. Now notice we're not incrementing j. We're not just going to the next position in the table. We're incrementing a counter that tells the hash function, OK, you need to try again, uh, that you're on the first probe, or the second probe, or the third probe. One strategy is to indeed increment j, but that will be hidden in the hash function itself. It's called linear pro probing. Now, if you have uh, m attempts, uh, then you have a hash table overflow. You know, since there's a fixed number of positions in this approach, then uh, you can fill the table up. Search is very similar. Uh, we're going to start with the first hash with i is 0. And uh, if we find it there, that's a successful search on the first probe, we return it. Otherwise, we increment i. And then we test to see, well, if it was actually nil, that means it's not in the table. It's, we're going to return failure. And if, if i has reached m, we're also going to return failure because the table is full and it wasn't there. Otherwise, we're going to repeat and rehash uh, with the i increment for another probe, checking for it again. So 
if it doesn't find k on the first attempt and it's not nil, that means something else was there. And then you go through the loop and you look somewhere else. So you keep doing these hops until you find uh, where it is. Now what about deletion? Well, why, why don't we just search for the thing and then if it's there, write nil and that's it. Well, notice how search here does this sort of hop thing. You know, let's, let's put a quick table up here. You know, the search here says, well, uh, let's go in the first attempt. If, if it's there, return it. Otherwise, if it's not there, it's something else. We're going to increment i, and we're going to do some kind of hop to somewhere else. And then if that wasn't it, we might have to do another hop to somewhere else, and then there's the k. Okay, so suppose we use the same procedure to delete. Um, but we are deleting the y. So we go in and we look at the first place. y hashes this location. That's not it. We hop to here. That's it. Let's say we, we made that nil. Okay. And by the way, these arrows aren't here anymore. Um, and then later on, we come along and we're looking for um, the, the k that ends up here. Uh, we look in the first location. It's not it's something else is there. We do the rehash. Uh, empty cell, we think it's not in the table because we hit this condition, we return nil. But actually it was in the table, we just eliminated something along the path on the way. So for deletion, we have to write in a special value here that says, well this is empty, but keep looking if you're looking for something. So for deletion, we write in a special value deleted, and then if a subsequent search is looking for k, which initially hashes to this location, we do the probe. It'll check for the special value deleted, and then it'll continue to probe if it's not there. The problem is, if you um, do a lot of deletions, as you go, the table fills up with these deleted items, and then you're doing these hops that aren't really necessary because this element here could have been written to there. And so your alpha, um, your search time is no longer dependent on alpha because you're taking more hops than the ratio uh, between n, the number of things, and m, the number of... Um, locations. Uh, there's this this, this uh, extra item is not counted in this count. There's a whole other approach which is not discussed in the book that I found online that tries to do a sort of a, a shuffling like when you delete something then you look at the next position and see if there if this k would have mapped to there you know that that k ended up there because it had the hop across the step that you're deleting so then you copy that k back there and then the same thing could continue there could be some other uh, uh, item let's say um, let's say o down here that actually originally hashed to there hopped 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 uh, or maybe that item hopped, hashed to here and then had the hop there and you've just moved that so you got the same situation so the this code has to iterate to go you know find all the things that got pushed further down because of one of these hops copy them back so you can look that up online it's an interesting approach so now let's look at some different ways that we can define the uh, hash function h of k i for doing different kinds of probes well actually uh, many of these methods use an auxiliary hash function h prime which just takes the single k it, it operates like the ordinary hash function under a, a chaining and then we're going to start the probe sequence here this is what you use for when i is zero and then we're going to um, write a definition of hki that will say where to go next so in our first method linear probing linear probing we define hki to be h prime of k plus i and then the whole thing mod m. So use a base hash function add i, this is the linear reprogramming, and then mod m in case you're wrapping around the table. Uh, so this thing will do, um, I'll draw it horizontally here. You know, if the first um, hash where uh, i equals 0 and you got some k comes into here and it's already occupied then it simply rehashes with uh, adding i to you know the value that you got from the first hash so then it checks there and it'll, you know if that's occupied it'll check here and the mod m part you know makes it wrap around to 0 if you uh, if this result gets up to n then it's going to go back over here and wrap around the array problem with this approach is primary clustering 
which is where you can obviously you can get all these clusters building up so now anything coming into this region is likely to collide with this little growing island and then it'll grow bigger because then you keep uh, adding on the edges it's like the uh, accretion on the edges of a continent that's growing so quadratic prob probing was invented in an attempt to solve this problem so quadratic probing uses uh, a more a fancier age function to take bigger hops so rather than just adding i, it adds a quadratic function of i, some constant times i plus some other constant times i squared. C1 and C2 are constants. But it turns out that this doesn't solve the problem. We get secondary clustering. Uh, essentially, secondary clustering means, well, you may not be checking the next linear element, but it turns out that there's some pattern where the hops are bigger, but then you get islands that are growing uh, essentially, the islands are not contiguous to each other, but with respect to the sequence that you would hop through, um, a sequence of things builds up. So it might look like you know, the first sequence uh, is like this, and then somebody else comes along, and even though we're not going to just the next position, we're taking a hop that hits there, and hits there, and hits there, so it grows bigger. So secondary clustering um, is a problem there. Now I'm going to clean up this, this screen a bit and compress things to make room for our next method. The next method is called double hashing, where you're going to have two hash functions, um, h1 and h2. And h1 will be the initial probe, and then h2 will be the uh, remaining probes. And so we want these functions, of course, to be different from each other. And so our hash function h of ki will be, will work like this. This is uh, h of 1 is done on k, and then i being 0, 1, 2 adds this other hash function for the reprobes, the whole thing again mod m, so you can wrap around the table. So you have to make h of 2 relatively prime to h of 1. Relatively prime means that uh, what it's going to generate has no factors in common with what this is going to generate. For example, uh, the numbers 6 and 7 are relatively primed to each other. Uh, 6 is relatively primed to 7, even though 6 is not a prime number, because they have no factors in common other than 1. And that guarantees that the probe sequence will be a full permutation of the positions. And there's two approaches to doing this. Uh, one is to say m, the table size, is a power of 2, and make h 2 os produce an odd number. The other is to let m be a prime number and have h 2 os be between 1 and m. This approach will give theta of m squared different probe sequences because every possible combination of h1 of k and h2 of k gives a different probe sequence. So it's an improvement over linear or quadratic hashing. So um, this is a good one to use if you're going to do it this way. Okay, you can find examples of uh, double hashing in my web notes and also in the textbook. We're going to wrap this up uh, rather quickly here with the results of analysis for open addressing. I won't actually do the derivation of these theorems, but I'll just show you what uh, has been shown. The uh, proofs are in the textbook, theorems 11.6 and 11.8. Suppose we have, uh, again, this is open addressing. And we're going to have a load factor of alpha is n over m, as usual. And that's going to be less than 1. Of course, with open addressing, we don't have the linked list to throw extra elements in. So you can't have more than m elements in the table. So n over m is always less than 1. So let's first look at the case of the unsuccessful search. So the expected number of probes in an unsuccessful search is at most 1 divided by 1 minus alpha, as proven in the book. Uh, this is assuming uniform hashing. Now what about successful search? This one's a little bit more complicated, and the result is 1 over alpha times the natural log of what we just had over there for a successful search. And this is under the assumption that each key in the table is equally likely to be searched for. There's a nice little piece of this proof. If you read the proof in the book, you'll find one 
part where they say, well, the expected value of, of the searches of the probes for this is 1 over 1 minus alpha, which is equal to 1 plus alpha plus alpha squared plus alpha cubed plus this is um, part of the proof for the unsuccessful search, this one here. And uh, basically, the intuitive interpretation of this is for an unsuccessful search, you always have to look the first time. And then based on the load factor of the table with probability alpha, you're going to have to search again. Uh, again, with probability alpha, you might have to search a second time. And probability of alpha, you might have the, you know, those first two slots are occupied. And then you might have to search a third time, and so on. So take a look at the proof in the book. We are going to work with these two uh, facts here in analyzing uh, some situations. We'll just apply these theorems. So that concludes the topic, the collection of screencasts on hash tables.